you turn to the Gospel of John this morning to chapter 10, and while you're doing that, I, I will remind you, and you can see uh, from in front of me, we have the elements of communion. We'll be participating at the Lord's table towards the end of the message, and to begin to prepare your heart for that, uh, the Lord's Supper is something that is really sacred to us who love the Lord, and Jesus is now going to minister to this group of Pharisees that's trying once again to pin him into a corner, and he's going to remind them that he is the Son of God, and as he does so, he's reminding us that he is the only way for anyone to ever have a relationship with God the Father. And it is through the blood of the cross, through his broken body, that that happens, and that is what we celebrate as we celebrate communion. That Jesus Christ died on Calvary's cross, that he was raised three days later, and he has paved the way for us to have eternal life in providing a perfect sacrifice for us as sinners. And so if you've yet to receive Christ as your own personal Lord and Savior, I want to challenge and encourage you right now as we take these, the remainder of chapter 10 here in John's Gospel, we'll pick up in verse 22 down to the end at verse 42. As those elements come to you, if you don't know the Lord, we, we ask you to allow them to go past. Please do not participate in the Lord's Supper. If you do not know Jesus as your Lord and Savior, that's an offense to God, and, and it tramples underfoot the blood of Jesus Christ. And so, better still, you can invite him into your life right now as we study the Word of God you can receive the grace of God through the free gift of Jesus Christ and life eternal. John now turns our attention to a passage of Scripture that has been battled over for 500 years as to what Jesus was really trying to say as he makes it very clear that eternal life is actually eternal life. The church has fought over whether eternal life is eternal life or whether eternal life can be taken from you or eternal life can be given up. And Jesus here, I believe, settles that for us. And in doing so, he kind of speaks to the side of this argument that says if grace originated with God, it was propitiated by God, it was provided for by God, uh, it, it is literally a free gift that we can be saved, that I'm pretty sure that we who have really received the grace of God are absolutely secure in that salvation. And so I pray that none of you will be confused, but we're gonna run into a couple of doctrines here in this passage that cause people grief, give them some trouble every once in a while. Uh, and chief among those are what we call eternal security. Once you're saved, are you always saved? Can you lose your salvation? Can you give it away? That comes up here. The doctrine of predestination, which is most easily understood, that God chooses, God picks. Scripture repeatedly reminds us that we were the chosen of God since before the foundation of the world. So do we choose God or does God choose us? Or is it somewhere in the middle? And thirdly, the doctrine of election. When did God choose us? And by what means? And so all of these things were addressed in these final 20 or so verses. And I believe they're addressed in such a way that we can understand them. Remember that all scripture was given for doctrine, correction, reproof, instruction in righteousness, so that the man or woman of God might be complete and lack nothing. So these words are words for the church. Would you join me in prayer and then we'll dig into this passage. Father, thank you. Uh, Lord, that you uphold us by your mighty right hand. That truly before the foundation of the world was laid, there was a plan to redeem us. That you certainly being sovereign know all who will be saved. 
God, these truths that are hard for us to wrap our minds around, Lord, would you help me to be able to express to your people how much you love us. God, we bless you for blessing us with your word, and we pray that you'd give us now understanding as we study, and we ask this in Jesus' name, amen. Verse 22, and we'll finish the chapter. And now is the Feast of Dedication in Jerusalem, so this is Hanukkah. This is a winter feast, it's the final one. It was very celebratory, much like the Feast of Tabernacles where we joined Jesus back in chapter seven. And so there's been about two and a half months that have gone by and Jesus is uh, now back at the temple again. And it was winter and Jesus walked in the temple in Solomon's porch. And then the Jews surrounded him and said, how long do you keep us in doubt? If you are the Christ, tell us plainly. They've become beyond agitated. They've become beyond irritated. They're done playing. And Jesus answered them, I told you, and you do not believe. But the works that I do in my Father's name, they bear witness of me. But you do not believe, because you are not my sheep. As I said to you, my sheep hear my voice, and I know them, and they follow me, and I give them eternal life, and they shall never perish, and neither shall anyone snatch them out of my hand. My Father who has given them to me is greater than all, and no one is able to snatch them out of my Father's hand, and I and my Father are one. This is one of the greatest statements of the deity of Christ that you'll find in Scripture. And then the Jews took up stones again to stone him. So you know that they knew exactly what Jesus was saying. There was zero contestability of the matter. The Jews heard Jesus say these things and they immediately put two and two together, you are saying that you are the Messiah, you are God. And Jesus answered them, many good works I have shown you from my Father. For which of those works do you stone me? Now remember, go back through your mind just a little bit in the things that we've seen here in John's Gospel. Jesus meets the Samaritan woman at the well And she says, mm, I've had five husbands. And Jesus says to her, well, actually, the guy you're with right now, you're not married to. Then we meet the adulterous woman who's caught in the very act. And Jesus, in front of the Pharisees, says to her, woman, where are your accusers? Neither do I condemn you. Go and sin no more. And then there's the lame man that goes to the pool of Bethsaida and comes back walking and leaping and praising God. And then there's the man born blind who the Pharisees were sure either he or his parents had sinned causing the blindness and Jesus said, oh no, it is so that my father might be glorified in him. And so Jesus, reflecting on that, says to them, which of these good works that I have done in my Father's name, which one of them is the reason that you're going to stone me? Was it because I healed the blind man, or the lame man, or either of the sinful women? Perhaps you heard about the issue at the wedding in Cana of Galilee, which one of these things are you going to stone me for? And the Jews answered him saying, for a good work we do not stone you, but for blasphemy. And because you, being a man, make yourself God. It's pretty clear what Jesus is saying, and it's pretty clear what they understood him to be saying. 
And Jesus answered them, is it not written in your law, and this is from Psalm 82, which is a judicial psalm, and in it, man is made greater than all other creation, and he says with a little g, you are God's. Just as I said. And if he called them gods to whom the word came, in other words, he said, if you being mere mortals could understand the word of God, and you know that scripture cannot be broken, it comes from God, do you say of him who the Father sanctified and sent into the world, you are blaspheming because I said, I am the son of God? For if I do not do the works of my Father, do not believe me. But if I do, though you do not believe me, believe the works that you may know and believe that the Father is in me and I in him. And therefore they sought to seize him again, but he escaped out of their hand. And he went again beyond the Jordan, some 40 miles to the east, and down from the city of Jerusalem to the place where John was baptizing at first, and there he stayed. And then many came to him and said, John performed no sign, but all the things that John spoke about this man are true. And many believed in him there. Incredible passage of scripture as Jesus paints the picture that he is God's own son. Jesus has spent his time, and this actually is a picture I took when we were in Jerusalem. There's actually a mini Jerusalem. It's a scale model of the city. And at the time of Jesus, this would have been Herod's temple. And Solomon's porch, which is referenced here, is that colonnaded area. Uh, To the left of the picture from your vantage point, Uh, is the meeting place of the Sanhedrin, where the 70 would gather with the high priest and his assistant, uh, and in the center, the temple itself. But Jesus is wandering in the colonnaded area, and, and he's now beginning to get the picture that his time on this earth is gonna be short. He's surrounded, he's in enemy territory. But Jesus continues this picture for us that says, this is not about religion. This is about you believing in the only Son of God. This is not about you doing anything. This is about you receiving the grace of God. And in our day and time, Jesus might have well been speaking to the false religionists of our day and time. Notice that Jesus didn't say, well, just wait, you know, another 640 years and you can become a child of grace by believing in the Quran and Muhammad. Or maybe you could just believe in Buddha, believe in something, believe in faith, have faith in faith. Have faith in trees or wind spirits or flipper or shamu. Maybe you could write another testament of me. Author a few other books. No, no, Jesus makes it very clear. And you have to remember back to what he's already told these very same people. You will die in your sins if you do not believe in me. He's saying, look, I am the watershed moment. You you either have a choice to believe that I am the Son of God or not. And of course, they choose not. Jesus was not inclusive. And as he meets with them there in the Feast of Dedication, celebrating the, the dedication of the temple, it had been ransacked, it had been violated uh, by Antiochus Epiphanes, and he'd slaughtered a pig on the altar. And, and as that happened, 
It would be reconsecrated to the Lord three years later after Judas Maccabees conquered uh, the Temple Mount and took it back for the Jewish people. And so it was a joyful time. And so the leaders were all around. You can almost, this is nearly like the gunfight at the Yamaka Corral. You know, it's like they have him, it's like, okay, we're going after it right now. You know, you can almost hear Jesus in a southern drawl. Are y'all saying that you're the son of God? He's like, yep. Sure am. There's only one of me, and you have to believe. He gives an explanation to them. You, You see, from the human standpoint, we become sheep by believing. That's what happens. It's not a work. It's not something that you do. You believe on the only begotten Son of God, and thereby you receive the grace of God. And coming along with it is the indwelling of the Holy Spirit and the eternal life that is guaranteed to all who will believe. But from a divine standpoint, we believe because we are his sheep. Jesus said, my sheep, hear my voice. And so you can see God's been doing some choosing. God's been doing some electing. God has been predestining those to be believers in Christ Jesus. That's hard for us. Where does our human choice and God's perfect plan enter into the picture and simultaneously coincide Both these things are equally true. When when you're lost and all of a sudden you hear the voice of the shepherd, you go running to the shepherd because you know he's the shepherd, which at the same time identifies you as a sheep. That's why I believe John records this particular passage in conjunction with the rest of what we call chapter 10. Because Ephesians 4 is clear. We were chosen in him, in Christ, Before the foundation of the world, God knows his sheep, and he's not going to miss any of them. But we also understand that we have to believe in him in order to be saved. And so this conflicts our minds. It's like, so so which one is it? Did God just save me, or did I actually have to believe? Both are true. And so to that end, Jesus begins to say that the sheep that are in his sheepfold, the sheep that are in his pasture, the sheep that hear his voice are absolutely safe and absolutely secure. You see, sometimes people think that they're only part-time sheep. They're temporary sheep. That you can be a sheep one day and a goat the next. Scripture does not paint that picture. Because salvation originated with God, it was mapped out by God, it was provided for by God, it was known before the world was ever created by God. He actually prophesied of what Messiah would do and how he would do it before he ever came. So I'm pretty sure the Lord had a plan before you were ever born, before I was ever born. And because he's God, he absolutely must know everything. He's omniscient. He's also omnipotent, all-powerful. He's also omnipresent. He's everywhere at once. And so in all these things, you see, we're conflicted of mind. Because we don't see how the free gift can be a free gift if God decides who's going to receive the free gift. Well, here's the good news. God wants everyone to receive the free gift. That's why he presented the gospel to the world and not to exclusive people groups, not to just some. That's why the Great Commission isn't, well, go find some people who already look like sheep and preach the gospel to them. (laughs) Go ye therefore into all the world, and preach the gospel. You see, we don't know who the sheep are, but God does. And he knows every last one of them. 
and he is able to keep them. All of them that are committed unto that last day, unto the day of Christ Jesus. You see, we are saved by grace through faith, and that not of ourselves, not of myself, not of yourself. It's a gift, it's not of works. None of us can boast about it. And so if we're saved not by good works, but we're saved by grace, then one cannot become unsaved by bad works. But you can become really miserable as a Christian by bad works. And you can suffer through all kinds of horrible things because of bad works. But if you were saved by grace, you're kept by grace. You're going to get home because of grace. Hallelujah. Amen. Because if you got to keep your salvation, you are in deep trouble. That's why Jesus said, none can snatch them out of my Father's hands. He's making a point here. Father God's hands are very strong. He's got you. Paul, as you would write in Romans chapter 11, if by grace we've been saved, then it's no longer works, otherwise grace is no longer grace. If it's of works, it's no longer grace. Otherwise the work would no longer be work. He's, he's making this point to us. He's saying, look, I'm saved because I have believed. The very thing that Jesus is challenging this group of religionists to believe is that you cannot work your way to heaven. And you are not going to keep yourself saved by continuing any other kind of work. You're saved by grace alone, through faith alone, in Christ alone. That's it. Now the good news is, once you become a child of God, you recognize that grace, your whole life is going to get turned upside down according to the things of the world. Because that indwelling Holy Spirit is going to give you a hatred for sin. You're going to loathe your old self. You're going to mortify your flesh. You're going to really have a rough time being any good at sinning anymore. The conviction of the Holy Spirit will come upon you. It's like, Jeffrey Scott Gill, you're not supposed to do that. God uses my whole name when I've been bad. <laughs> it's kind of like your parents, only much worse. <laughs> Jeffrey Scott. You see, that's the Holy Spirit at work in you because you are a child of God. And people come and they say, well, how, how do I know? Well, you know because you love the things God loves and you hate the things God hates. However imperfectly you may love the things that God loves and hate the things that he hates. But the fact of the matter is you love what God loves and you hate what he hates. And can I give you a little clue here? God does not hate people ever. No matter how deeply entrenched in sin they are, he does not hate them. That's why Jesus came. He hates the sin. The sin is what God hates. God loves people, including wretched, awful sinners, and the proof of it is you. <laughs> amen? amen? Say amen. 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 Because if you had to figure out how to get saved before you got saved, you're in deep water, amen? amen? Because most of us were not looking for God when God found us. We were going the other way. We're like, we're totally happy over here in our drugs or our alcohol or our relationship or in our wicked ways or our conniving business things or whatever. Wherever God found you, wherever it was that you all of a sudden recognized the voice of the Savior and you said, yes. That's his grace at work in you. You see, the true Christian's joy, prosperity, blessings can be radically impaired by sin. But if you were saved by grace, you're a child of grace through faith. You're not a child of works. And so you will be a miserable sinner. 
And furthermore, Paul actually tells us, and again, read Romans 5, 6, 7, 8. What then? Should we go on sinning that grace might abound? Paul answers that question. Heavens, no. Certainly not. What then? Should we crucify again the Son of God? You see, no true child of God is going to continue to live in sin. And if you're comfortable living in your sin, then I suggest to you, you have one of two things that's operating in your life. Either you are not actually a child of God, or you are about to run into a brick wall called God's sovereign hand. Because God doesn't play when it comes down to sin in the life of a believer. And we're going to see that in our study in 1 Corinthians. I'm going to ask the communion team to begin to pass out the elements of communion. Jesus gives a very plain answer here. You're going to receive first the bread and then the cup. And if you would be so kind as to hold both elements and we'll participate together at the end. Worship team's going to come back out at this time as well. You see, Jesus promised security to his sheep. The elements of communion are the promise of security. Christ shed his blood. He allowed himself to be bruised, beaten, and broken to provide something for you that you could not provide for yourself. So Jesus gives them a plain answer. He makes a statement. It's going to startle them. They're asking for it. They're saying, tell us plainly. And he says, okay, I and my father are one. I told you I am the son of God. I'm telling you, you have to believe in me. The plain answer was something they've tried to avoid. And the plain answer is still something people try and avoid. People want to believe that there's some other way. People want to get to that place to where they they can choose their own path to salvation. But Jesus makes it very clear in absolute bold relief here that God has chosen his sheep and he's called them with his voice. And you're either a sheep or you're not a sheep. You can't be a dog or a cat. You can't be some other kind of pseudo-believer You can't be partly in the kingdom. You can't have one foot in the world and one foot in heaven. You're either in or you're out. And notice as Jesus says, he says, but you do not believe because you're not my sheep. And therefore I said to you, my sheep hear my voice. I know them and they follow me. Jesus being exclusive. He'd already told them back in chapter 8 that the reason they didn't hear is they were of their father, the devil. They were wolves. They weren't sheep. And so they didn't hear the Lord's voice. And as we've heard the Lord's voice, as we've responded to the Lord's voice, as we recognize that we have been found You see, for me, I recognize that I was found by God. That the Lord found me. And my response to being found was, I I received what he wanted to say to me. Now, can you imagine? You're totally lost. You're wandering in the middle of the desert somewhere. And... On the horizon comes a rescuer, and that rescuer has a GPS and a sat phone, 
and knows exactly how to get you out of there, and you look at him and say, no, that's okay, I'll get my own way. I got myself into this mess, I'll get myself out. You're gonna die. That's exactly what people do when they hear of the grace of God. And they turn towards religion. They turn towards some other way. They say, well, that, that's okay. I hear your voice, I see you. I recognize who you are, but I wanna do it some other way. There is no other name under heaven whereby men must be saved. That bread that you hold in your hand already, the cup you're about to receive, represents the only way, the only truth and the only life. It's Jesus' hand that holds all sheep because you've received a grace gift. God's great grasp of grace. Have you ever thought about that? You ever thought about trying to wrestle something away from the hands of God? If your Bible says, nothing, no one can snatch them out of my Father's hands, I think that means exactly what it says. That's the great grip of grace. It's a miracle in and of itself that we can even be saved, amen? amen? So the fact that God even initiated this whole process and says you can't be plucked out of my Father's hands. He's called us, he continues to call. He's drawing men into salvation. Don't reject that call because it's the shepherd's voice. When he's crying out, he's saying, I, I know my sheep will hear my voice, and all I need to do is cry out and they'll come. But you can reject the voice. You know, sometimes people think two very extreme things. either that they are outside of the reach of grace or that as a child of God, they've somehow sinned their way out of God's grace. And both are pictured really in 1 Corinthians chapter five. And there's a man there that's so deeply entrenched in sin that he's become uh, an issue for the church. And about him it is said Let him die, then men will forget what has happened. Deliver such a one to Satan for the destruction of his flesh that his spirit might be saved on the day of Lord, the Lord Jesus. That is a prodigal of prodigals there. That's the great grip of grace there. That's God holding on to someone who's even tugging away from the fingers of God. But that's the great grip of grace. And while no one can claim to be a hearer only and not a doer, and no one can claim that they get to continue in their sin when Scripture says you can't continue in your sin and claim the grace of God, you need to be really secure that the real grace, the true grace, and the true life of a true believer is also keeping grace. Saving grace is keeping grace because it came from God. And he's got a hold of you. And so when he starts to squeeze you a little bit, when he starts to say, you know, Jeff, you probably ought not do that anymore. 
Otherwise, this grip of grace is going to start to cause you some pain. Then you want to listen. Because that's God's goodness, because he chastens those whom he loves. He takes out the shepherd's crook, and he'll occasionally whack a sheep that's wayward. Amen? Don't despise the chastening of the Lord, is what the book of Hebrews says. You see, God loves us enough to correct us as well. So what do we see as we live in grace? We see his broken body for me. God explained grace to me at the cross. And as Jesus spoke to his disciples, he said, as he took the bread and broke it, he said, Take and eat, for this is my body, broken for you. He might, has well, might have well has added to that. I want to explain grace to you. Here's my broken body, offered in your place. Let's partake together. And then to make sure that the picture was complete in their minds. He took the cup after supper and when he had blessed it, he said, this cup is the cup of the new covenant. As often you drink of it, you do so in remembrance of me. But he added, that it was for the remission of sin. You see, my problem with God is my sin. That's my problem with God. My problem is not that I don't do enough good things. My problem is I'm a sinner. My problem is that my life compared to maybe many of your lives One might say I'm circumstantially kind of okay, but that's not the issue. The issue is a holy God can't dwell in the presence of sin, and I'm a sinner. And so Jesus said, take and drink for this cup is the new covenant in my blood shed for you. Let's partake together. Would you stand with me and we'll pray. Father God, we thank you. Now before any of us were ever born, before this world was ever formed, that you recognized each one of us, you've known us, and you love us, and you sent Jesus into this world to die for our sins so that we could live with you. And Lord, we thank you for your great grace. We thank you for your sacrifice, Jesus, that your body was broken and your blood was shed to pay the price for our separation. Lord, what separated us was our sinfulness and you have cast our sins as far as the east is from the west. They now reside behind your back in the depths of the sea and you remember them no more. You truly are God and we honor you as God. We bless your name as God. We thank you for our salvation that's so rich and so free. Thank you for your body that was broken and your blood that was shed. 
We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen.